everyone, I'm Christina. And I'm Pastor Emily, and I'm on staff at East Coast International Church. And this is our Holy Week podcast. This week, we're going to be taking a look at every step that Jesus took from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday by looking through a bunch of scriptures. As we follow the steps of Jesus, we'll also be looking back at some Old Testament passages and forward to what this means to us. We hope you guys enjoy. Now let's get into it. Shaping the rivers into words What grace comes from your lips Hello everyone, happy Good Friday! Hey guys, thanks for joining us again. Alright, so we're going to jump right into the passages and then get into the discussion. Emily, could you read from Matthew 27? Absolutely. Matthew 27, starting in verse 1. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared. For I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The leading priest picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was payment for murder. After some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field, and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That is why the field is still called the field of blood. This fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says, They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. I'm going to skip over to Luke to finish reading up the passages for today. Um, And we're skipping a kind of a chunk of the story where uh, Jesus is brought before Pilate. But just moving straight into Luke 23, verses 26 through 49, it says, As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others Both criminals were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself! A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself, and us too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in Paris. By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, 
Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching. So today is Good Friday in Holy Week, and it's probably the second most famous day of Holy Week. I think when you think of Holy Week, you think of Good Friday and Easter. Yeah. So a lot of us kind of are really familiar with the story, but just as a refresher of what goes on throughout this day, we know that yesterday Jesus was... Um, he had his Passover meal, he was betrayed and arrested, and then he went to that, like, sketchy trial with the Sanhedrin that lasted through the hours, like, through the night hours. Mm -hmm. It was basically an all-nighter. And then, so early in the morning, as we see here, they're already done with their Sanhedrin thing. They've decided to kill Jesus, and so they take him to the Romans so that the Romans can do the dirty work. Um, and then they put him before Pilate, they rile up the crowd to, you know ask Pilate to, to crucify him. Pilate agrees kind of hesitantly. And then um, the whole crucifixion process begins and Jesus undergoes um, capital punishment under the Roman regime, which was, he wasn't the only one to experience that, but it's detailed in Jesus's case in, in gruesome detail. Um, so we hear about him carrying his cross and going to the place of the skull and the two other criminals that were that were with him and kind of how was the crowd reacting and how was the, how were the Roman soldiers acting and what was it that Jesus was doing and we know um, that Jesus actually from the time that his crucifixion began at 9 a.m. to the time that he actually died at 3 p.m. it was six hours of him being on the cross that doesn't count him getting whipped or um, carrying his cross or any of that stuff that happened early. So this is a really quick process. I mean, they decided to kill this guy with very little deliberation. Um, and it, it really did happen just as fast as the story kind of makes it out to be. It wasn't this big, long, drawn-out thing. So then Jesus dies, and like the passage that we just read says, a bunch of things happen. The sky is dark, the, the veil is torn, the Roman soldier realizes this guy really was the son of God. And and then we kind of have that, that last line ringing in my ears and the disciples watched from a distance. Hmm. And so that's where we're at with Good Friday. Um, and we're going to get a little bit more into the details of what happened, trying to highlight a few of the things that Christina and I found particularly interesting as we were researching and going a little bit deeper, but it's such a rich story. There's so much here. I mean, so much. Yeah, there's no way we're covering everything, yeah. <laughs> but it's good to reflect on it. And so thanks for joining us as we reflect. Yeah, so I want to take a look at this, uh, this little section with Judas. It's very interesting. Um, he sort of has this turnaround moment of repentance and also like really freaking out realizing what just happened um that jesus has been condemned to die and he runs to the temple and is like like i just condemned an innocent man yeah. and the pharisees don't care and they're like that's your problem dude like you have to deal with it and so he flings the 30 pieces of silver on the floor and then runs out can I just say, yes. like, when the Pharisees said, like, what do we care? That's your problem. Mm -hmm. That made me so, <laughs> so mad. Yeah. Like, I'm angry because, like, what moral bankruptcy. Right. The, like, to to, yes. to be like, you, you are an accomplice in our, basically, our kind of, like, murder by Roman rule. Yeah. And you've just helped us with that. But now we're going to act like, oh, no, no, no. That's all on you. Like, we, we that's your problem. Yep. I just, like, so wild to me how they can. Yeah, I was reading something this morning and it had said that 
this like this could have been this possibly could have been a moment where Judas was brought to repentance Mm -hmm. um but but the priests the people who were supposed to be there to help you be in right relationship with God were so hardened that they that they um like he was just brought to even more despair yeah and he ended up going out and hanging himself and just ending his life there um yeah it's crazy that's uh, that's like just how satan works i think like because even if i would have imagined the pharisees would have wanted to save face and be like no judas like this is right that you would did this because this man is evil but it's like they recognize that judas sees right through all of that and that he knows this is wrong yeah and as soon as he knows it's wrong their only play and and when i say them i mean like this is how satan is right like satan's only play is to try to push you into despair away from Mm -hmm. god yeah. Like, it's like, okay, well, if I can't trick you anymore into thinking that you're in the right, while well, really you're wrong, well, then I'm going to push you into despair. Right. And, man, and then, and then ju- like, juxtaposed next to their kind of like, oh, it wouldn't be right for us to put these pieces of silver in the temple treasury. It's like, dude, what, what kind of, like, what is even directing these people and the only thing i can think is that either they were super super like they were superstitious people that kind of were like oh like anything murdery like can't be in god's but i don't know they were just acting like it wasn't a murder and like judas we don't care that's your problem that he's innocent and you betrayed him and right there's definitely double standards there like superstition just for the sake of tradition yeah. not any moral like anything to it and and they know too like they they paid men to lie about like to give yeah. false testimonies like they know yeah and that's true it did the whole thing was just rotten yeah so like overt overtly yeah. rotten yeah and so um and so they buy this field uh the potter's field and it becomes a um a cemetery for foreigners and so still with the superstition because it's like, oh, this is blood money, so we can't use it as a cemetery for our own people. Yeah. It has to be for foreigners. Like, our, our own people are too good for that. And there's but, the racism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're just all kinds of wrong. Um, but but this passage is interesting because it says... Um, it, it it says this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. And so let me just take you on a little journey that I had in research this morning that is that is very interesting to me and hopefully interesting to you guys. But um, there's... There's a little confusion here because the only place in the Old Testament where you can find words similar to these verses is in Zechariah 11, even though they said it it fulfilled a Jeremiah prophecy. Uh, some people say it's because in um, the in the Jewish text, Jeremiah is the first prophet um, that comes, it, like chronologically or however you say that word. Um, and so when they're referring to something that was in the prophetic literature, they might just say, like, oh, that's in Jeremiah, which refers to all of the prophecies ever, um, because that's the order that it comes in. But I did a little digging because I wasn't too satisfied with that. And so I just want to share what I found. Um, so the passage in Zechariah 11, it's verses 12 to 13, and it's, it's really interesting, and so it's another one of these passages of judgment on Israel, Israel's leaders, um, it, the Israelites themselves. Uh, basically, um, the, there's this shepherd figure, and he has a staff called favor, and he has a staff called unity, and he's gotten to this point where he's just so tired of the sheep. He's like, I don't even care what happens to you anymore. And he breaks the staff called favor and he breaks the staff called unity. And it's like this breaking of 
of covenant um between between them and and he's just done with them he's angry with them and he's like i'm gonna just leave you to the 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 other shepherds that will um that will take advantage of you that won't take care of you well and so both the is he's both um talking about the israelites themselves and also the religious leaders and just their corruption and uh we can see in this passage too how that that's also a prophecy about the state of the religious leaders at the time of jesus they're just so corrupt so wrong um and so so this is where israel is at and then these random verses show up in the middle of that passage and it says i told them if you think it best give me my pay but if not keep it and this is the shepherd talking to the sheep so they paid me 30 pieces of, sil of silver and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. And so there's not much explanation about what this means. But uh, my understanding and the, the understanding of uh, some theologians that I looked at today are saying that this is a messianic uh, prophecy in the midst of this passage of condemnation towards Israel. Um and so there's also a passage in Acts that talks about how Judas purchased a field and then killed himself in that field. But if we look at this passage in Matthew, Judas is not the one who purchased the field. It's the, the high priest. Um, and so uh, this verse says, So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. And so it's like Judas, by default, purchased the field because he threw them on the ground and then the priest picked them up and purchased the field. So that's where that comes from. I just thought that was interesting. That's just like a nerdy, a nerdy um, Bible geek kind of thing. But it's like Peter said Judas bought the field. Zechariah said Judas bought the field. And then really the high priest bought the field. But Judas um, betrayed Jesus and he got those 30 pieces of silver and those were his and they went towards buying the field. It's, it's interesting how a prophecy can find something so specific and in the future it's fulfilled and you're just like, whoa, that's crazy. Like, like it happened. It's almost like the, if I'm understanding correctly, it's almost like the identity of Judas and the Pharisees is being converged yeah. in that moment as the ones who betrayed yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And the ones who then purchased a field with what, if I'm not, if I'm reading correctly, Zechariah is being sarcastic there where he yes. talks about this handsome price yes, that you valued price. me at. <laughs> like, like basically like, this is all you think I'm worth. Like it's a pittance. Yeah. I'm the good shepherd. And right. you, when you put a price on my head, the price you give me or the rate as in Zechariah, the rate of pay that you offer me is like just ridiculous, right. you know, ridiculously low. Yeah. But he's just kind of sarcastically being like, yeah, this handsome price that you, yeah. you know, that you paid me. Here it is, you know, take it. Yeah. Yeah. This is what they valued him at. And, and in this passage, he's just so done with the sheep. He's like, um, I'm not dealing with you guys anymore. Um, but then I looked to Jeremiah because I was still curious why why they say Jeremiah if, and if there was anything in there. And so there's these passages in Jeremiah um, 19 where Jeremiah has to go to a potter's house and buy a jar. And then um, he smashes the jar and he declares this whole prophecy of condemnation again and he talks about how they were um, they were doing um, I, they were practicing idolatry in this field uh, right outside of the potter's house and they were sacrificing children and they were worshiping there and uh, just innocent lives were spent in this field and he says, no longer will this field be called uh, Hinnon Valley, but it will be called the, the field of slaughter. Um, and that's interesting because 
in um, in the Matthew passage, it talks about how this field became known as the field of blood. Mm-hmm. And the crazy part is these two fields are in the same valley. They're both in Hinnon Valley. And so the field of slaughter, the field of blood, I just thought that was really cool. Wow. Very interesting. Might have been the same field. Didn't Jer- so Jeremiah also bought a field. He too, also bought a field. But that was actually which I'm wondering if this ties in. Mm-hmm. You see, it's like layers on layers on layers. Right. But um he bought a field which was actually a prophetic object lesson of God's redemptive plan. Yeah. For Israel. Because basically it's like he bought a field at a time when siege was em- like imminent when Israel had already gone as slaves into to um Assyria. Right. And so now Judah is left. That's where Jeremiah is. Yeah. And his cousin is like trying to get trying to sell his land. And a lot of people are like leaving at this time. Like people are fleeing Judah because the economy is going downhill. Babylon's yeah. breathing down their neck, and they're in moral decline. And it really seems like there's about to be trouble. And so this is like, it's basically like think of it as like a housing market crash. Like the economy is mm-hmm. beginning to crash because everything's falling apart. Yeah, and in you the don't context really of be this, buying land right exactly. <laughs> in the context of this economic crash, God tells Jeremiah that he's going to have an opportunity to buy a field and that he should do it. And yeah. then his cousin comes to him and is like, technically, like, I'm supposed to ask you first, but I'm trying to, like, sell this land. Right. So Jeremiah buys it, but it's, like, this picture it's of a how... It's that it, it will become fruitful again. Exactly. Like, one yeah. day this is going to be worth something. Like, you're buying yeah. it now and it's not. Yeah. But later it will be. Yeah, and that's the thing is with these prophecies that are so um, just terrible, <laughs> and there is always a... Like a, a but in the future, it's going to be okay. Um, and so Zechariah uh, goes on to say in 1210 um, that just basically God is coming back. Like he was frustrated. He was like, I'm done with you sheep. But then he comes back and it says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they had pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child. And John uh, John quotes this passage, um, the one they had pierced. And so this is, this is a messianic prophecy because wow. John quotes it about Jesus. Um, but then it, it goes on to talk about uh, a fountain that will cleanse them from sin it goes on to, and this is the same passage, if you remember back, where it says the, the shepherd was struck, the sheep scattered. Um, and and then it talks about uh, just just a perf- purification and how the Lord comes to reign and there's living water that will flow out of Jerusalem into all of the lands and the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And it's just this amazing thing to read because it's, there's a messianic prophecy about Judas tied into there. There's a messianic prophet prophecy about um, Jesus up on the cross. There's the prophecy about the disciples being scattered. And then the, there's the prophecy about how there will be purification and forgiveness of sins. And G- God will rule over the entire world. And it's just like all wrapped, wow. all wrapped up there in a few chapter, chapters in Zechariah and... And I just love this. I just love it. It's amazing. Yeah. And we've, I can't believe we've spent all this time just talking about Judas so far. And like, that's like, it's like one small detail in the story of Holy Week. But really, like, there's this kind of depth Mm -hmm. throughout of like, just kind of interlapping and and, and overlaid meanings. And, yeah. And and we're just scratching the surface. I mean, we're not theologians. We're not, you know what I mean? We're not like academic scholars, biblical scholars. We're just people who love the word and are reading it and using whatever free resources are out there. Yeah. You know, so I mean, that's incredible. We should probably move on. Yeah. We should probably move on. I wanted to 
just mention like there's this quick passage about um, how Jesus, while he's walking to Golgotha with the the the, the place called the Skull with his um, cross, it says there's a large crowd trailing behind and a lot of grief stricken women. And Jesus begins prophesying to these women who are weeping. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And again, he gives one of these prophecies about the coming um, destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. And if we remember, we talked about this on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, during his triumphal entry, Mm -hmm. he's giving the same prophecy. And then on Monday... And Tuesday, when he's teaching in the temple, again, he's talking about this, like the the things to come, when he's prophesying about what is to come. And he's he talks about the destruction and the um, persecution that's going to break out in Jerusalem. Yeah. And then he also talks about, like, the end times, the end of the age. And so it's just incredible to me that this is so, like, on Jesus' mind so much. This is now, like what is this, like the fourth day so far this week? It's Friday. Yeah. And he's literally about to die. And this is something that's on his mind, on his heart, yeah. something that he finds it urgent enough and important enough to talk to people about and kind of like raise a, the alarm and raise awareness about this um, coming judgment and coming destruction. And it's so interesting to me because if you look carefully – you see his heart in it. His heart is broken over what is going to happen to his people. So even as his people are rejecting him, even as his people are following these like false spiritual leaders and the you know morally bankrupt Pharisees, even as even as they have just like kind of participated in allowing his you know murder to take place he's mourning what's gonna happen to them he's not vengeful he's not and this is the thing like so many times people read the bible and they hear these harsh things that are being said and they think wow god is such an angry god jesus here is not an this is not an angry guy saying huh you feel bad for me i feel bad for you it's gonna be even (laughs) worse like it's not this like hateful venom that he's spitting it's this mournful grief it's this heartbroken love yeah this is this is the this is the love of a of a god of a king who is willing to care enough about his people that it it disturbs him when they hurt themselves Mm -hmm. it disturbs him when they run themselves into the ground you know and he's basically saying, like, get ready, like, be aware, like, you know, begin thinking about these things because it's not going to be this moment of just kind of like peaceful, you know, occupation by the Romans is going to come to an end. And as we know from from world history, Jews have not had peace for an yeah. extended period of time since the time of Jesus. Yeah. They basically, I mean, there was a great diaspora in, in 70 AD with all this stuff happened and um, and the Roman emperor went crazy and blamed everything on the Jews and there's been anti-Semitic sentiments throughout world history, yeah. you know, from that time on. And, they, and, and Jesus is seeing all of that. He's seeing all of that and he's mourning it. Yeah. And he's, like, preparing them for it. So I just think that's fascinating that that's on his mind and on his heart. Yeah. On Good Friday. I I think, like, Jesus says, um, weep for yourselves, don't weep for me. And, like, you you were saying, that shows his concern for them. Right. Um, But I think, ultimately, man will destroy itself. There will be wars. And um, the Romans were about to take over in a few few decades. And... um, and he was also telling all of those end times scary things. Yeah. But he said to spread the gospel of the kingdom. And gospel means good news. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, Jesus is like, you guys are going to go through some stuff. And it's going to be hard. And even, like, like mourn about it. Like, yeah. he's not like, you know, like, suck it up and, like, power through. He's like... 
Like, it's going to be scary, and, and I'm scared for you guys, and, like, yeah, like weep about it, you know? Yeah. But, but in the midst of all of it, spread the gospel of the kingdom. And so it all points to that day when he will ride in in peace, and he will rule over the whole world. Yeah. And that's, that's what we look forward to. We look that's forward to the at. kingdom. Yeah. And that's why today is Good Friday. Yeah. Like, today is... Well, today is the day that humanity murdered God. Yeah. But God's people call it Good Friday. Right. Like, and it's because it's just because of this insane, unthinkable, and yet beautiful way that God turns things upside down. Yeah. Um. You were talking about the bone. The bones yes. that kind of plays into this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um. So in John 19, when it talks about that Jesus dying, it says these things happen so that the scripture would be filled, not one of his fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. Um, and so this is a reference to Exodus 12, 46, which if you guys remember uh, when we were talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I read from some passages in Exodus 12, 12 that yeah. were giving like regulations for Passover meal and what you're supposed to do. Yep. And the lamb's bones are not supposed to be broken. Um, and so I, I can just see, like, for for hundreds of years, they're not breaking the lamb's bones. And they're kind of just like, I don't know why we're doing this, but, like, yeah. this is religious tradition, so we're not going to break the bones. <laughs> and then, like, you see, to fulfill the prophecy, and it's like, oh, Jesus' bones were not to be broken. Yeah. And, and just a side note, why does it matter that his bones were not broken? Um, so when you, when people are crucified, they, they can sort of hang on to life longer by lifting themselves yeah. up and to breathe, um, because they can't breathe when they just allow themselves That's to That's actually how you die right. on a cross is by asphyxiation. Yeah. Typically. Wait, what does asphyxiation mean? Asphyx- asphyx- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I can't say. It's, it's, um, jeez, what a thing to laugh about. Um, asphyxiation is when your airway is blocked and you aren't able to breathe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so typically that, that's what would happen. Um, but if you remember, they're trying to kill Jesus before Sabbath. They're kind of in a rush. They can't bury his body on Sabbath. Right. Um, and also there is a passage in the Bible in Deuteronomy 21 that talks about someone who is... Uh, put to death on a on a pole or like a plank or a tree needs to be buried that day because they're cursed and basically you need to get rid of the body as soon mm-hmm. as possible. Um, so this this is this is like a bad death in terms of like if you are a person who is crucified you are like a defiled person you're yeah very low. I mean they would leave people on the cross. And it would take people, like, two days. Like, people would yeah. be up there, like, yeah. for a long time. And so to speed it up, which is what I think you were getting to, they yes. would break their bones. Yes, to speed it up, they'd, they'd break their bones so that, you know, they couldn't breathe anymore. And the crazy thing is that Jesus died really fast. Really quickly. <laughs> which, it only took him six hours. Which was, <laughs> like, which was crazy. And the thing that, that I found really interesting is that just before Jesus dies, he says, uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he's quoting Psalms 31, 5, and then he breathes his last death. And so it's like Jesus wow. had control of the moment that he died. Like he, he said the thing and then he breathed his last breath. And so it's like very evident that this is not satan having a victory over jesus right like satan is not in control wow. here in any way wow. god is in control the whole way and um in that psalm let me just turn to it real quick psalm 35 uh there's also a verse that says um where is it what is it sorry psalm 31 yeah. verse 5 yeah So 
So it says, into your hands I commit my spirit, deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. And then verse 8 says, you have not given me into the hands of the enemy. And so wow. it's like, it's like he's not in Satan's hands. He's not in the yeah. enemy's hands. His death, like the death of God, what he, like he put his spirit into the hands of God. He's in control. He's doing this for a purpose. Yeah. And Satan, I don't know what Satan is thinking right now, but he's probably not rejoicing. Like, he probably under, I think that he probably understands the implications of, like, this is exactly the opposite of any kind of victory over God. This is God's victory in the sense that his plan is becoming accessible to everybody on such a crazy level to the entire world, and this is... Like, so many prophecies are being fulfilled right now. Mm -hmm. This is the Lamb giving the ultimate sacrifice um, to bring so many people in communion with God. And it's just amazing to me. Yeah. I, um... Man, I think that's so incredible. It reminds me of the passage um, that says that uh, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Yeah. And I remember, do you know that gospel song that says, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper? Mm -hmm. I remember, like, when I listened to that song, that was the first time I ever realized, like, oh, yeah, like, that's not just, like, a straight, like, victorious statement. It's kind of like a statement in the midst of you're literally being, like, attacked. Like, people (laughs) people are sharpening knives to get at you in this, in this story. And, and somebody's, somebody is, is molding and shaping and designing a weapon that is designed perfectly to get at you. Yeah. But God's going to block it. Yeah. And to me, that's like, that's like what I see on the cross Mm -hmm. in so many ways. And it's like this idea of like, everything converged in this perfect way to destroy Jesus. Yeah. But it didn't prosper. It didn't destroy Jesus. Jesus instead destroyed death and sin. It's crazy to me. Like, um, yeah. And that's, what's good. That's what's so good about good Friday. And that is, that is what we're called to. I wanted to just share a few thoughts. Um, I don't want to go too long here, but I wanted to share a few thoughts about, you know, the divine implications and the human implications of what's happening in Jesus's death. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus, I mean, Jesus, if, if you know your doctrine, you know, Jesus is 100% God and one, 100% human. And that's a, like a mystery that is not, it's a paradox is what it is. It's not like something that we can mathematically like calculate in our heads it's very difficult to wrap your mind around but it's this idea that jesus is god and man at the same time fully god and fully human um and so as god jesus was doing something with cosmic implications here Mm -hmm. i really like oh man sorry just to back up i was i was listening to about the whole bones being broken and how the Passover lamb's bones weren't broken. Yeah. I was listening to a commentator who talked about how Jesus planned to kind of push forward the tensions of the moment so that he would die. He timed it so he would die on Passover. Hmm. Which, like, he died the day after the Passover meal, which was technically still within that same 24-hour frame. Yeah. And, And also Passover... Sometimes people interchangeably use that for the Festival of Unleavened Bread, which is a week-long thing. Anyway, so he died during Passover. Yeah. But um, he timed it. Yeah. Like, he timed it. And j- just thinking about that, like, he's he is telling them, like, guys, I'm the lamb. I'm the lamb. I'm the lamb that you put my blood over your house. Mm. And you're rescued from death, from certain death. Mm. Like, which, how could we even understand what it means to be rescued from death? Like, when they were being rescued from death, it was like, well, some people died and other people didn't die, you know? But like us being rescued from death, we're rescued from death by being able to go through death and still live. 
Mm-hmm. It's like an ultimate rescue from death. It's not just like, like you won't die now, but you'll die later. Like it's <laughs> like, it's like no, you're never, never gonna die. Never. Like yeah. it's like you're gonna die, but it just it's not gonna take. Mm. Like it's just gonna like roll off you, like water off a duck's back. You know, you're yeah. just gonna like. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyway, so he was doing something in this moment. He was conquering death in a way that obviously none of us could, could do. Because all the time I think like people must wonder like, why does it matter that Jesus died? Millions and billions of people have died. Why does it matter that Jesus was crucified? So many people have been crucified, crucified, like specifically crucified. It's not even like there's something. And then also you think about like the torture, the humiliation, all of the things that Jesus experienced other people have experienced right why does it matter that he did what makes him different Mm -hmm. and this is what makes him different is that he was god it's his divinity that makes it so different isaiah 53 which is just part of this huge passage that says all of these incredible things but isaiah through the inspiration of the spirit of god prophesied about jesus when he said um He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. So that, to me, is like this perfect picture of what was happening divinely on the cross. Something that no human could do. Only God could gather together all of the filth and all of the rot and all of the curse and all of the pain and all the sorrow of humanity and take it with him into death. Mm. And that's what Jesus did. And like, so there's, there's the divine implications, but then there's the human implications. And the human implications really speak to me because I'm a human. Right. I'm not God, but I am human. And Jesus was human. Yeah. And as a human, he tells us that he set an example for us. Yeah which is pretty intense if you think about it jesus was being obedient to god showing restraint when he could have asked angels he could have commanded angels to deliver him and instead he showed restraint and he succumbed to all that was happening around him he was humble his character shows through like he's on the cross making arrangements for his mother he's on the cross going through one of the most physically grueling experiences that a person could have pass through i would imagine and he's in prayer yeah concerned about his relationship with god yeah father why have you forsaken (laughs) me god into your hands i commend my spirit like the character of jesus have you ever heard that like you know like if you cut them they bleed like loyalty like if you cut me i'll bleed like love if you cut me i'll bleed like it's it's not character jesus's character wasn't just like a human behavior that he tried very hard to act with yeah but it like went to his very core yeah it it, it, it inundated every it was in and through all that he was his humility his love for others his forgiveness and willing like he's he's god forgive the roman soldiers they don't know what they're doing He's, he's he's praying for people around him he's he's the women are weeping for him as he's going to the cross and he's saying guys like i know it's bad what's happening to me but worry about what's gonna happen to you like Think about what's coming. You know, he's like, he's in these moments of desperation. He's not only desperately undergoing this trial, but he is, he is trying so hard to take advantage of his last moments on the earth to be able to give to others and say the things that need to be said and care for others and you just see that like character come through so strong if i could real quick that just reminds me of one of my favorite verses it's hebrews 4 15 it says Mm -hmm. for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin 
And so it it's right, like, his character shows through, but he, he's been here. Like, yeah. he knows what it's like to be human. He knows yep. the struggle. Yep. And he empathizes, he's compassionate with it, which yeah. is so amazing, right? Because on the one hand, Jesus says, like, John 12, which is the, the passage I was going to read here, Jesus says, um, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. He's talking about his death and and how it's worth it because it's going to produce something good, even though it's horrible. And, and then he says, those who, he turns it on us. He's like, this, I'm, this is what's about to happen to me. But then he turns it on us and he says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. Mm. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. And so like on the one hand, he's saying, follow me, yeah. take up your cross, you know, use my example as a model for your life. Yeah. Don't think of me as like, oh, only God could do that and we'll never be like Jesus. No, try to be like me. Yeah. You're my servants. You come, come, with, come with me on this journey. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, in Hebrews, we hear that he's sympathetic, he's empathetic, that he cares, his compassion is there. He knows what it's like to be tempted. Yeah. He knows what it's like to be weak. He knows that we fall short and he looks on us yeah. with love. And that's the heart of God throughout all of Scripture. Throughout all of scripture, it's that hard. Like, I don't know. To me, it's amazing. Mm. To me, it's amazing how desperate God is to rescue humanity. Yeah. That he would place that kind of value on us. That he would love us that way. You know, it's like he's looking for, he's looking for us to reach out in any small way, you know? Yeah. And that's why when I was reading about the, the man on the cross next to him, the criminal, I began to cry because it's just so, like, this guy had so little to give Jesus. Hmm. Like, it's it almost is, like, pitiful. He, he tells his other, you know, fellow criminal, don't you fear God, you know? Don't you respect God even as you're dying? Like, this guy didn't do anything wrong. And, and then he's like, you know, Jesus, remember me in paradise. Like, and it's, it's almost like, I hate to say it, but it's it's very small yeah. what that man did. Yeah. You know, but Jesus was like, it was like Jesus was so glad to respond by saying like, this very day you'll be with me, you know? Like, it, yeah. it was like, it's like you take a step towards God and he floods and envelops you with love. And, and it's like, he's just, he's so close to us and he's waiting so desperately for us to just say yes. Yeah. And to just go with him and to just let him love us and let him be our our Lord and our King and the one who's in charge and um Yeah, and the way the way to follow him may be difficult, but he he's made the way, like he's gone before it, he's done it all yeah. himself and we don't do it alone, we do it with him and right. through him and by him and like it's it's through what he's done that we are able to yes. follow him and it's not an easy thing to follow him right. but it's because of him and it's for him and yeah and man he's worth it <laughs> yeah 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 in him in him and through him and by him right yeah was it in him we live and have our being yeah yeah and he's the way to life yeah and i'm so glad today that he's still with us Maybe not in the same way he was when he was walking with the disciples, but his spirit is here. And yeah. Jesus, we just thank you. Why don't you join thank me you, in Jesus. prayer as we close? Jesus, we thank you for being with us today. Yes, God. We thank you, God, for defining what good is and, and teaching us that good is not just ease and comfort in this world, that good is not just a, super fat, a superficial happy thing but that even in the darkest of circumstances even in the most difficult of times even in the most trying moments that you can make things good Thank you, God. because you're you're the master of recycling <laughs> you're the 
You're the, the king of redemption. You're the greatest artist that ever was, God. Make a mosaic out of our lives, God. Take the broken pieces and make us whole in a new and beautiful way, infused with your spirit and infused with your grace and mercy, God. God, I pray today as we as we think of all that you've done for us on that cross, God, give us deeper revelation and draw us deeper into love for you, Father. God, we, we love you so much. We love you so much, Jesus. Help us to love you more. Help us to love like you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.